Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. I'm Delano D'Souza. Details of the Pegasus scandal, which broke last week, raised eyebrows over the health of the world's largest democracy. Indian journalists, opposition politicians, activists and even election strategists were among those listed as potential targets. NSO, an Israel-based company, sells its Pegasus software to government agencies as a tool for fighting terrorism and crime. It turns a smartphone into a pocket spy by activating the mic and camera. The Indian government continues to dodge questions over whether it is an NSO client. My guest today is Shashi Tharoor, Indian MP and member of the Congress Party. Thank you very much for joining us here on France 24. Now, you are the chairperson of the Parliamentary Committee on Information Technology. Do you think you, you'll get many questions answered given how the government has chosen to react? No, in fact, the government has not only not been cooperative, they have actually uh, prevented the senior officials we had called to the committee yesterday uh, from showing up so that we've had this extraordinary, unprecedented situation where a summons from a parliamentary community, a committee, committee has been disobeyed by the officials concerned. And this is uh, something which, which uh, we've never seen before in Indian democracy. It's quite an extraordinary development. They have no desire to answer questions on this issue. Uh, they are they, the ruling party's members on the committee who form, who constitute a majority, attended the meeting en masse but refused to sign the register so that there would be no quorum for the meeting to proceed. They're trying every trick in the book not to discuss this matter. And within parliament itself, they have refused to admit any discussion of the subject. And you are calling for a judicial probe. How will that be any different, you know, with a government that's intent on, on killing the story, essentially? Well, in theory, at any rate, the judiciary is a little more independent. We follow the British Westminster parliamentary system, where the executive is, a, is a, an emanation of the legislature, and therefore the legislature, once the government has been formed, is a captive of the government because the majority in the legislature constitutes the government. So there is no real genuine Montesquieu kind of separation between the two. Whereas a ju judiciary is at least in theory completely independent and autonomous, self-renewing institution. The judges are not appointed uh, by the government, but by each other. The, the, the judiciary renews itself mm. uh, by choosing uh, new judges uh, itself. And therefore, in theory, at least, if they were to take on this probe, if they were to agree to a Supreme Court monitored uh, judicial investigation, and they would be able, first of all, to be freer of government control than the legislature is. And secondly, they would also be able to have greater powers than, than we would. I mean, to give you one example, um, we don't have the power to call volunteers from those who've been hacked to give us their phones and send them off to forensic analysis. Uh, to ensure, to check whether Pegasus hacked them and when they hacked them and how they hacked them and so on. Uh, a judge could do that. And so some of those things would be very different if the judiciary were to get involved. There are a number of petitions pending before the Supreme Court asking them to order a judicial probe. We haven't yet seen a, a reaction from the Supreme Court. You know, Mr. Tharoor, opposition figure Rahul Gandhi was listed, listed as a possible target in the run-up to the 2019 general election. Can India really still call itself a democracy when political rivals are being spied upon like this? Well, it's, it's, it's quite shame-making because, you know, even all of us who are critical of many, many things the government does and the manner in which it conducts itself, uh, have always argued that, look, at least we have free and fair elections. Uh, and, and as a result, these people do represent uh, the majority political opinion in the country. We have to work with that within our system. Uh, but if indeed the pitch is being queered, it's not just the uh, hacking of an opposition figure in the shape of Rahul Gandhi. There's also been Pegasus invasion of the telephone of an election strategist and consultant Prashant Kishore. who was advising Prashant Kishore, who was advising the chief minister of West Bengal in her successful re-election bid uh, in the face of an onslaught by very uh, strongly resurgent BJP efforts to unseat her. And at the same time, there was also... Uh, Apparently, um, uh, we don't have this confirmed because his phone has not been examined. There was apparently uh, uh, on the list a former election commissioner, Ashok Lavasa, who was um, one of the three election commissioners we have in that autonomous body. And he himself, unfortunately, um, 
uh, left the election commission and went to a, a different job in the Philippines uh, when he came under pressure to conform uh, to the, the government's dictate. So, so there are some real worries that, yes, the actual counting of the ballots may be fair, uh, and, the, and the, the casting of votes. But, but the playing fair, field is skewed. Syria or North Korea. Now, but now, the playing field is skewed, exactly. Indeed. Now, you know, an article in The Guardian states that the selection of Indian numbers uh, sort of happened after Prime Minister Modi's trip uh, to Israel back in 2017. He was the first Indian prime minister to visit the country. Does it sound to you like there was, in fact, a quid pro quo? And if so, are you alarmed at how there isn't more pressure being placed on Israel, a beacon of democracy in the Middle East, might I add, to provide some answers? That's right. We notice, for example, that France is putting a lot of pressure on Israel uh, because the French president's a number has also shown up on one of these uh, databases. And therefore, uh, Israel is being asked to account for this happening. And that's the right thing to do. It is astonishing that the government of India has not at all uh, put any pressure on Israel to do this, uh, to, to explain itself or to look into the matter. And that simply confirms suspicions that the government itself must be behind uh, what happened with Pegasus. You know, last week, uh, France 24 interviewed Rohini Singh, one of the journalists at The Wire, the news website. And she told us that investigative journalists in India sort of live with the fact that they are being tracked and traced. But what she wasn't aware of was the extent of the surveillance. A free press, we always say, is vital for holding governments to account. But if the press is no longer free in India, where does this leave things, essentially? Well, the press is free, and that's why we have a Rohini Singh and, and we have an outlet like The Wire uh, so far. But there have been curbs, restrictions, harassment. Uh, we've even seen the arrest and detention of journalists who are simply doing their job. Um, and we've also seen a rather shameful level of conformity from much of the so-called mainstream media, the print media, uh, and, 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 and a significant majority of the television channels uh, have tended not just to toe the government line, uh, to give more credulity to government explanations, but also to uh, consistently demonize the opposition, which is not supposed to be the role of a free press in a democracy. It's supposed to be one of the pillars of democracy that helps hold government accountable. But most of the, uh, the media and the, and, and the channels uh, spend their time going after the opposition and boosting, uh, seeking to boost the image of the government and the prime minister. I mean, one could argue that election results would show you that that works because that's what uh, seems to be helping uh, confirm the political popularity of the prime minister and his party. But we in the opposition uh, are clinging on to um, our faith in democratic institutions and processes, which after all existed for seven decades or six and a half decades before these people came to power and which we hope one day to restore again uh, because democracy has been one of India's proudest attributes, so much so that the present government keeps going on touting abroad how important democracy and diversity are to India mm. and how much they, they value the fact that they are a large and diverse democracy. We are trying to get them to live up to their own professions. You know, because one of the, the Indian government's mm. responses was that uh, the, the Pegasus project was an international conspiracy, essentially, to malign India. That seems to be the go-to response in times of trouble. We saw what happened during, during the COVID crisis. Uh, do you agree that some country, there are some countries in the world that are intent on narrative building, but they're not necessarily democracies? Not only are they not democracies, they're not terribly influential in global narrative building. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of countries in our neighborhood that wish us ill, and we've known that for some time. But uh, the global narrative we're talking about is shaped by, by and large, the Western democratic media, uh, which has celebrated Indian democracy in the past and has been increasingly concerned and then increasingly critical about the direction in which the present Indian government is going. So there is a difference. There, there is no question that um, if you were to look at the way in which, uh, shall we say, bluntly, uh, democratic institutions are being undermined and weakened by the uh, government of the day, by, by, by today's Indian government, mm. then very clearly the concerns are justified. And we're seeing more and more reports in the Western media pointing to these things. And indeed, uh, people in the opposition are saying this within India too, but perhaps it's getting more traction in, in the, um, shall we say, in the, in the visible prominent media spaces abroad.
You know, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, was in India just this week, reiterating the importance of the country's democratic credentials, fundamental freedoms. A lot of countries are placing an importance on India in the face of an assertive China. We see France doing this as well. But do you fear Western states will will have to turn a blind eye to the chipping away at, at democratic freedoms in India, given the importance that it's being placed on the country? Well, look, I'm, I'm, as an Indian, I certainly believe that it's important to shore up an Indian alternative to China, because the assertive, as you say rightly, wolf warrior diplomacy of China, they're pushing themselves around their uh, expenditure on their Belt and Road Initiative and so on, uh, is really a challenge to, uh, in many ways, the decent democratic ways of running the world and of, of running individual countries. So, yes, it's good to be able to point to an India as a viable democratic alternative to China. <clears throat> but that's why India should be held to those democratic standards. There is no point in saying, you know, we, we must abhor China and uphold India if India itself is, is imitating in some ways some of the, the, the least admirable qualities of, of the Chinese system. And therefore, yes, support India. India deserves it. The Indian people, Indian culture and Indian democracy deserve it but then help shore up Indian democracy by telling the government in all your interactions with the government that we value you as a partner because you are a democracy, because you have freedom of the press, because you have opposition politicians uh, who are willing and able to speak out. Do not destroy our ability to support you. And that would be a very helpful message that the Western world could continually keep giving to a government which sadly in many ways is slipping away from the very standards it professes internationally. Indeed. Uh, Shashi Thurwa, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Thank you. That's it for this edition of the interview. Thank you very much for watching.